Good morning, Lexi Odds, Rogers Freak here. Sorry for the, the delay this morning. There was something I needed to accomplish this morning and uh, it took a little longer than I thought and uh, just got done in time to be here for 10 o'clock. Sorry for the late start, guys, but don't worry. Everything will be done just a half hour later this morning. Good to see so many people in the chat already before I start. Uh, good morning to Alistair. Woo! Woo! Uh, Monique, good morning to you. Uh, good talking to you yesterday. We're going to figure out all the details about a Raptor Freak meet and greet on August the 26th. It's three weeks from today. It'll be a Friday evening here in Toronto. We're thinking somewhere on the Danforth at a restaurant uh, that'll fit for everything that we want to do for this whole thing. It'll be a meet and greet where I'll be there. Monique will be there and we will be having like a, a live stream at that time in the evening instead of in the morning, like I do now. And also we're going to have stuff like Monique and I are going to trade basketball cards and we'll have little uh, interviews with different people from the, the stream. If you guys feel like being on camera, you don't have to do it. Don't come. Don't be scared to come because I'm going to put you on camera or anything. You have the option. You do not have to go on camera if you don't want to. Please come and join us anyway just to say hi and everything like that and stuff like that. We'll talk about more of the specific details about this event in the weeks to come as we iron it out and stuff like that. Uh, David S. is here. Good morning. Uh, how are you today, David? And good morning to Sue also and Monique saying i've been on part of one and two of this series lex must listen with nick nurse all right listen monique's watching this thing that i'm talking about today my main subject for today is this course and lectures uh that uh nick nurse did in hungary recently that there's it's all online it's all on youtube and it's about six hours of content i went through it all yesterday i watched every single bit of it and i have to tell you guys that within the last 24 hours, I've learned more about Nick Nurse, his coaching staff, and how he does things than ever in like one day, like just from watching what he did over there. He has everything just laid out on the table for all of us to see. And he tells so many different things. Like, let me give you an example of the kind of thing that I learned yesterday. First of all, you know, when I do the ref report, for the previews for the games during the season? Well, they do a ref report themselves internally. In fact, Nick Nurse loves what I do on the ref report because he does the same thing. He looks and sees what the refs like. I was wondering about this last year. Remember y'all was saying, I hope Nick looks at this and maybe uses this. Well, he does. He says, if he sees that a ref likes prints in the likes and dislikes and stuff like that, he will talk to the ref about their, his love for prints with the ref to try and get better favors. So he is reading those lists of favorite musician, favorite movie, favorite book, favorite, all that stuff. He's looking at that information about the referees and going into games, knowing that this could be ammunition to get some, some friendliness with the referee. Oh my gosh. So many things opened my eyes, the things the way and the reason why Nick nurse does the things he does on his team it is so highly recommended if you are a huge Raptor freak like I am and you really, really want to understand Nick Nurse. The, the course has different parts to it. Now, some of the coaching parts where he's actually coaching the players over there in Hungary and telling them where to run and what to do and stuff like that. That's really kind of a coaching exhibition for the coaches that were in attendance at the lecture. But it's a little boring. Like you, there are parts of it where you may feel like you're watching Scotty's Twitch and it's like not always action and interesting. But it was really cool to watch still because you get to see Nick Nurse's coaching like up close. The way he talks, the way he motivates, the phrases he uses, you can tell like his whole voice and uh, the way he talks. He has to be like me sometimes. Like I talk for two hours, three hours straight sometimes on this stream. Well, he has to have a really strong voice to be able to yell and talk at, at such a volume in NBA games all through the game. And he's constantly encouraging. Like you can hear the things that he says to these Hungarian kids when he's running them in drills and you get a picture of what he's like with the Raptors and their practices. This is a really uh, unobscured view into the coaching mind and way and why he does certain things. It's absolutely brilliant and amazing. Some of the things I learned about him, I'm not going to lie. Like, did you guys know that Nick nurse is the youngest of nine children and that in Iowa, when he was growing up, he didn't get anything handed to him. In fact, it, in his household, they weren't that well off. And he was the youngest. He had to scrap 
Like he said in, in one of the interviews on this lecture, he said that when he was a kid, when he woke up in the morning, he listen, they're, they're joking around about the milk and the cereal, which goes in the bowl first right now with the team. Forget about that. Just try and get the bowl or the cereal or the milk in Nick Nurse's childhood because they fought for every single little thing that they could get. Like if he wanted cereal, he had to get down there before his siblings. He had to get that bowl. He had to get everything for it. So he had to fight and claw and be super competitive as a little kid. Like right away, because he had older siblings and there were only so many things in their family for everybody. And that if he didn't get there and get it done, he, he, it wouldn't happen. He said it like this. It's like, listen, the reason why I ate this birthday cake so quickly, he's in Hungary. He gets his birthday cake because it's his birthday there. And he's eating the cake. And he's like, y'all are probably wondering why I ate this piece of cake so fast. It's because I'm trained to eat really quickly. Because if I didn't eat fast, one of my other brothers or sisters was going to eat my food for me and stuff like that. So this really is a huge uh, character tell about why he is who he is and how, what drives him and makes him so competitive that as a very young child, he was the youngest of many siblings and everything was fought over everything. You didn't get anything in the nurse family unless you fought for it. And you had to, Oh my gosh. He said it was like that 24 seven. It started with breakfast and getting the cereal bowls and the milk. And it went on to the next thing all during the day, competing with his brothers and his sisters for things in his life. I couldn't believe that. Oh, my gosh. So crazy. So crazy. So crazy. Um, all right. Let's see. Yeah. Um, let me get into y'all's comments. Uh, good morning, TGIF. Shane Waters. Happy uh, Happy Friday, Facebook friend. And hello, David S. Hello, Sue. Uh, Scotty's looking good at scrimmage at Rico Hines training camp. Yes, there was a little bit more footage that was uh, dropped yesterday. And in that footage, we see Gary working. He hits a nice three. We see Chris Boucher out there cooking some guys. He was playing against Scotty, and he got in between Scotty and Gary and got a good dunk. Uh, we see Thad Young is there also. Thad Young is working in there. Uh, so it was really cool. We're seeing more and more of the Raptors show up and in the pictures and stuff. More of OG also. Seeing OG there and stuff like that. Fred, yes, Fred is there. The whole team is there. It's just crazy. One of the things I saw from that half-hour clip of Rico Hines' highlights, the one that we were talking about yesterday, is that Pascal is really happy about Coloco being on this team. Like, if you watch that half-hour highlight, every time Coloco gets an offensive rebound and a putback, Pascal's turning his face and he's smiling real big. Like, you can see him smiling like, ooh, I like having this Coloco guy on my team because he's cleaning up the garbage. Like, Pascal would go in and he'd get a nice layup. It just didn't go in exactly right. But, boom, there's Coloco right there with the ball and putting it back in. And that's got to feel good to have somebody tall and stringy like that to have your back. And stuff like that. But you watch that video, you will see what I'm talking about. Every single time Coloco did something badass, Pascal had the biggest grin on his face. Like he's a proud over older brother and stuff like that. I love that. I love that so much. And yes, Scotty is looking very overpowering, Sue. I am got to agree. Like, not only does the man look really super strong right now, like he does not, he does not look like he was a rookie last year. He looks like somebody who's like in his fourth or fifth year. As far as his body, physicality, and the things he's doing on the court at Rico Hines are overpowering. He's killing guys. Like, he's cooking them. He's putting the crossover on people, and he's going around them, and then he's jamming hard. He's getting up above the rim like he loves to do. Get up on that rim is what Scotty says in his Twitch. Get up above that rim Ooh, and hang all over it and, like, hang all – get up all on that rim. Scotty, that's what he likes to say himself. He loves that. But yeah, Scotty's looking very impressive and scary. I know a lot of people are talking about James and these Rico Hines runs and stuff like James Harden, whatever, Sixers fans. But listen, the most impressive people at Rico Hines right now are Scotty Barnes and Pascal Siakam. The two of them look like they're in phenomenal shape, like like even different shape than last year. Like like uh, Nick Nurse said, Pascal looks electric right now. He looks electric. And Scotty Barnes looks like a huge person, like more than he was. Like if he was a rookie last year and we just saw him in his baby fat and just like his his very basic rookie like thing, you know, Nick Nurse did say in the whole in the thing that in the last uh, that I watched yesterday that he didn't call any plays for Scotty Barnes last year at all. He didn't call a single damn play for him. 
that he did everything he did to get rookie of the year on like hard work, uh, dirty work, glue work, getting the balls, just stuff like in the flow of the game. None of it was actually plays called for him or like directed to Scotty to be the man like they would with Pascal. So this really makes you start to realize the potential explosion of how good Scotty could be when we are using him with a very, very intent purpose and stuff like that. Instead of just saying, go out there and have fun and play like by your ass and just have a good time. You're going to be good enough. Then just imagine if it's more discipline and more of a plan to what they want Scotty to do as time goes on. That's what I'm saying. Y'all he's a weapon. And he's somebody that can be used in different ways, not just as a scorer, as a defensive stopper, as a passer, all kinds of different things. I'm loving everything I'm seeing from Scotty this summer. And it's so cool. Like, listen, they're all very quiet this week on Instagram. Usually they're posting stuff on Instagram left and right, the Raptors. Well, they're not posting very much this week at all. I'm going to tell you that right now. And I think it really is that they're wearing their asses out. (laughs) <laughs> they're going and doing the Rico Hines stuff and doing all this kind of stuff. And then that's it. They're just really, really putting it all on the court this week. So, and it looks like that from what you see, they look like real grind runs, like real grind ones. Not a lot of time, timeouts, not a lot of like stoppages of play. They just want them to go. Cause they don't even shoot free throws at Rico Hines. Hardly. They, they barely ever shoot free throws from what I hear and stuff like that. So, uh, all right. Good morning to Tom Duke. Once again, sorry, guys, I started late. Uh, good to see everybody here. Uh, yeah, Monique saying this. This is true. You can't this. Is, it's so in depth. The stuff that Nick Nurse is talking about in Hungary, like he goes over so many different old stories. Like I can't even like he has Kawhi stories, he has Serge Ibaka stories, his Mark Gasol stories. He has Danny Green stories. He has stories about all these different periods in Raptors history that he was involved with the team. And he is very candid. Like he talks about very specific moments during the championship run and things that they said behind the scenes and like just different things that happen and stuff like that. One of the things he talked about with Kawhi Leonard that was really cool was he talking about how when Kawhi was on the Raptors for the one year he was with us, he had a very, very scheduled, regimented routine as far as like icing and getting massages and getting treatments and getting like doing everything. Like for everything that Kawhi has been talked about as being negative in any kind of this way or this way, the one thing that Kawhi always does and has does to this day is he shows up. And he play, he does like treatments and he does everything in a certain schedule. And what Nick was saying was that Kawhi rubbed off a lot on Pascal and Fred and OG in the championship year that they still to this day do the Kawhi regiment and schedule of preparedness on off days and uh, days like that. Like Kawhi would apparently come down to the Raptors OVO on his days off and he would just do everything that was optional because he was taking care of his body to the utmost like p- potential and that they all took that from Kawhi. It's really cool to hear these little inside things. And like Monique is saying, she doesn't want to give it all away because there's real secrets that Nick Nurse is, is told in Hungary. And some of the stuff that he, I was, I'm with her. I'm a little worried about him being too open and honest about things. Now, if you if you watch the content, though, he doesn't really talk about his current team very often. Like he won't do anything that has to do with anything in the last year. He doesn't talk about Scotty very much in Hungary. He does talk a lot about the championship year, though, and a lot about a little bit about Tampa, too. He talks a lot about that kind of stuff. And he does get candid about players in certain situations and maybe some things he probably shouldn't have talked about and stuff like that. But it's really fascinating. I mean, as I, I go through the stream, maybe other things that will pop into my head will uh, I'll tell you guys about what Nigner said. Like, um, what's the one another really interesting, crazy thing I learned? All right, listen, when the, the Raptors play, this was a prerequisite for Nick Nurse to take the coaching job of the Raptors. He said he would not be the coach of the Raptors unless the Raptors and Masai Ujiri did this for him. And basically what it is, is after every single game, he nobody talks to him about what happened in the game. There's nobody who comes to him, whether it's front office or players or anybody. They finish the game. 
He does the interview. Well, first of all, after a game, he goes into the locker room and he plays his piano for for five minutes before he even talks to the press. That he has this ritual of playing the piano before practice and playing the piano right after practice in his office. And that he goes in there to play the piano after a game to calm himself down and to get himself cool. And then he'll go and talk to the press. So whenever Nick, (laughs) before he goes and talks to the press after any game, he has played on his piano before he comes back out and talks to them. Like, this is fascinating shit. And his whole reasoning is that, like, listen, he realizes, and this is so smart, and this is true for anybody in their own life. You can make a molehill into a mountain by the way you react to it. If you get too bent out of shape and too emotionally charged in the moment, right when something happens, it can be worse. So he's basically clearing the plate of any buildup of negativity after a bad loss or something like that by not talking about it afterwards, not making a big deal out of it at that time, like sitting in it, stewing in it, but not letting it to go out more than inside of himself. So he'll talk to the press. He'll be honest. He'll say like, yeah, we didn't play this well. We didn't do this. We didn't do that. And then he'll go home and he's nobody's allowed to talk to him about the game until they finally come in for like the meeting in the morning with the film and stuff like that. He doesn't want anybody in the front office. This is part of his contract in the he comes in in the morning before they go into that meeting. No one can talk to him about the game. They're not allowed to. He ha- they have to wait until they go into the tape room and they talk about it. So very fascinating way to deal with all this and stuff like that. Really smart because you minimize like emotionality and like overreacting and doing all this kind of stuff. And he does this for wins too. Like he doesn't get over or uh, too over a uh, crazy happy or too low on losses. This is the way he minimizes it and really deals with it in a very like medical kind of data from Star Trek, the new next generation kind of way. There's like, Oh, this is how it happened. And then boom. And there are other things like they have this thing where they put the pr- defensive performance stats up for the Raptors every morning after the game. And they let them look at it in a room by themselves before the coaches even come in there. They have the room set up and the guys are coming in to collect and they'll put the stats. How many times they blew their coverages How many times they didn't do the exact things that he cares about. And this is the thing, these stats that he puts up there that he wants them to look at, they have nothing to do with their offense. These are numbers that have to do with covering their defensive assignments. And then he said that what would happen was when they first started doing it with Kyle and DeMar, they would argue with each other about who had the better percentage, like Kyle and DeMar, and they get competitive about it. And they want to get their defensive coverage percentage higher. That it would get down to the point of like, all right, Kyle did 80% of his defensive coverages in the last game correctly. Well, DeMar did 78% of his defensive coverages correctly. And Kyle would rib DeMar and say, you know what? You didn't do as good as me. You should do better. And that is how they got better and competitive within. It's brilliant. Like they put this on the screen in the room where they had their meeting after a game and they're in there looking at their own stats and they're getting accountability between themselves before the coaches even come in. It's like they do a lot of the work the coaches would say to them without the coaches having to actually come in and say it. They look at it and they see it and they talk about it. It's amazing. That's brilliant stuff. Like really brilliant And it makes you understand why we are so good. It makes you understand why we are doing things so well. This isn't the kind of shit that Kevin O'Neill did. This isn't the kind of shit that, you know, these other coaches in the Raptors history have been able to do in the past. It's just absolutely brilliant. All right, let me keep going. Yeah, I worry about it, Monique, that he may have given away too much. But like they said, this is the thing. This is the difference, though. Listen, Nick Nurse steals from everybody. In fact, that was a big part of the whole conference in uh, Hungary. Him talking to Steph Curry's Davidson head coach that just retired, uh, Bob McClinic or something like that. He's over there. And they're talking about how coaches just steal everything from each other. They don't learn. They, they learn from other people. There's nothing original in coaching for the most part, unless you're like Nick Nurse. And I'll explain that in a second. 
the, 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 everything is stolen from each other. They read books that are written by other coaches in other sports. They read books by other basketball coaches and they learn from them and they steal ideas from them and things like that. Like they do that. Like when they were doing their little speeches, the Davidson coach and Nick Nurse, they would say, Nick Nurse would say, you know, you just said exactly what I would say, but I would say it in a different way and stuff like that. That's really true about coaching. And it may be true in other sports, not just basketball, that you copycat. You do copycat people. So what do you do to to not get like totally uh, stale? What do you do to stay ahead of the pack? If it's all a copycat, like a profession, coaching in the NBA. Well, you look for inspiration from other areas and things like that. That's part of the reason why Nick Nurse is on the piano. This is part of the reason why he's reading books constantly on leadership, not just leadership in sports, leadership in all aspects of life. And then, you know, he gets his inspiration from art. He gets his inspiration from anything in this world. And he tries to bring it in to make sense in a basketball sense to innovate that way. So he is always thinking ahead and is on the cutting edge of NBA coaching because he's looking at different kind of really crazy kind of ideas and things like that and stuff like that. So it's really fascinating, really amazing. If you guys have the time to watch these things, I could tell you which ones are worth watching because they have more meat of like talking and him telling stuff and which ones are more just coaching and him running up and down the court with young kids, telling them how to do drills and stuff like that. Cause that, those ones aren't as interesting. There is little stop parts in those that when he stops something and then he brings an example out about something from the Raptors and the history of the Raptors who say, well, in, in our championship year, I told Serge not to run in that lane or something like that. He'll, he'll bring stuff like that. So there is gold in every single clip that has Nick Nurse in Hungary. But the ones where he's sitting down and interviewing or taking questions and answers are the most illuminating because he really is like no censor. He, he, they ask him a question and he'll tell them straight up. He'll tell them exactly the answer. And he's not hiding anything like it's Colonel Sanders recipe for his original recipe or anything like that. He is putting it all out there. And it's absolutely crazy. But for, as a Raptor fan, holy crap. All right. This all makes a lot of sense now and stuff like that. Like he's talking about the referees and how to deal with them and what he does. Like he said that back in the day, they used to come into the arena and somebody on the training staff would put up the referees for the game for that day. And they look at the refs. And before Nick even got to the arena, people would see people like Tony Brothers on the ref crew and they freak out. Just like the just like the fans do online. Like, oh no, Tony Brothers. Oh no, we're gonna lose. Oh, you know, that kind of shit. And what would happen is Nick said that he'd come in and the trainer would put it up and spread around everybody, we're gonna lose because Tony Brothers, like they would be telling people in the organization, the trainer. Oh, we're going to lose because it was Tony Brothers again tonight. This sucks. Oh, damn. And for like a couple of hours before the game already, before Nick's even there, there's like a losing feeling in the building just because of the ref crew being put up and stuff like that. So Nick stopped that. He hated that. He was like, this is so stupid. Why do you think just because the refs were going to lose? It's like, listen, we try and get in good favor with all the refs is what he says. It's really interesting him talking about how he deals with the refs. Because in some ways he could talk very openly about the relationship with him and the refs in Hungary in this setting than I've ever heard him talk about the refs before. Like he's talking about how when he was coaching Lowry, there would be times where the refs would come over to him and say, all right, Lowry's getting on my nerves. If you don't get him under control, we're going to tech him or we're going to throw him out. The refs would literally come to Nick Nurse and tell him that Lowry's in trouble. And if you don't do something about him, so he would take a long time out and put Lowry on the bench just to sit and chill and wait until he kind of let his emotions get down. Like that's the kind of shit that was happening in the games and stuff like that. It's so illuminating. Oh my gosh. If you have the time, seriously, it's worth watching and hearing everything he's saying. Cause I'm not going to be able to remember every little detail or story about things that I learned. You know, he's very candid about the bubble and what happened in that bubble series and why we lost to, to Boston in seven games. He says that he thinks we should have won. 
that we were just a, a shot away from being in the next round against Miami. And that like, he doesn't really look at the Boston series as that much of a failure because it was so close. And that he says that like, there were a couple people that were in, on our team that weren't good. And he names the two of them. He said the two people that were not in shape and were not good in the bubble were Mark Gasol and Pascal Siakam. He calls them out. In this thing, you say, well, we would have done a little better if some of our guys had been more ready in the bubble. He's saying shit like that. I'm like, holy crap. He just said, like, not only did he say Pascal wasn't in the right shape in the bubble, he said Mark Gasol was not in the right shape in the bubble and not very useful in the bubble like he was other times as a Raptor and stuff like that. So crazy, crazy. All right. Tom Duke's bringing up a very important news story that is something that I did want to talk about today. Brittany Griner was sentenced to nine years in prison in Russia for having cannabis oil, for having something that's legal in so many different places on North America right now. It's listen, this has nothing to do with marijuana. This has nothing to do with the WNBA. This has nothing to do with that. This has to do with politics. This has to do with the fact that she has really bad timing for being in Russia, that the war was just about to break out. And she's now a political prisoner. This is what this is. Now, there's other dimensions to it that are really gross and deciduous. Now, obviously, the GOP, the Republicans in the United States are pro-Putin, pro-Russia for some fucking reason. I mean, Trump's such a good uh, Manchurian candidate puppet for the Russian government that his whole following is with them. And they all think that Britney deserves to be there. That They're so fucked up. That's so anti-American. She's an American. And she's being detained unjustly in Russia. You people that think you're patriots, that's an American. And all Americans are created equal. I don't give a shit if she has some sort of uh, gay or lesbian vibe or thing to her. I don't give a shit if she's African-American. I don't give a shit if she's almost seven feet tall. All I care about is she's an American and she is being detained unlawfully and wrongly in another country. And all the people in the states that think he's getting she's getting what she deserves. You're not patriots and you are not for America because America is for freedom. And she needs to be out of there yesterday. And that this is all political pawn at this point. She is a pawn in a political game. And that uh, people that are ugly are going to use her uh, LGBTQ status and things like that to hate her. And say, well, she deserves it. You do the crime. You do the time. Well, motherfucker, when you were in high school and you might have gotten caught with a marijuana joint behind the school and you were white, they probably didn't do anything to you. They told you to stomp it out. Meanwhile, they might have taken somebody else to jail. So don't give me this shit. Pay the crime for the time. Pay the time for the crime. Because you know what? So many people get away with the same damn shit and it only has to do with their color. So that's what I got to say about that. They need to get her out and they will. This is actually a good thing, her getting sentenced to this. This is the part of the process. The wheels are turning. Instead of her being in a limbo and not knowing what's going on, we knew this was going to happen. We knew Russia's going to give her nine years. This is exactly what they did with another person in a similar situation. But now that she's been uh, sentenced, they can really work to make a deal, make a trade and get her over here. I think that it's been in poor taste. Some of the sports outlets, the way they've been wording getting a trade for her, like it's some sort of transaction within a league or in sports, is in bad taste. Anybody who's making any uh, uh, jokes about a trade for her and like putting it in sports sense, fuck you. You're a cold hearted person that just doesn't understand this situation, how awful it is. This is not something to make jokes about. So now that she's been sentenced, they can really negotiate and hopefully get her back here. That this is this was part of the stages and the steps to do this. But they want to they want to trade a a really horrible person for her. Like that's who they want back. And it's tough to figure out and negotiate. But I know that it's all going to work out and be figured out for her and hopefully sooner than later. I really love all the support everybody's given her all over the NBA, the WNBA and stuff like that, whether it's the minutes of silence, all of the uh, postings on Instagram, Twitter, wherever it is, different people like Montrez Harrell posting free Britney, you know, and he has his own thing going on here with marijuana and the law right now. So it's like, you know, this is part of the culture war is the marijuana war. And we've been winning. Marijuana has been winning the last couple of years. We need to keep going. 
and need to keep destigmatizing marijuana use in communities and the where and people using it and stuff. It's a very helpful thing for a lot of people for different reasons and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Tom. It is a part of the whole process of what should be happening. And it's the next logical step, even though it looks bad and it sounds awful. Uh, Raymond Jacobs saying ref ref n- n- uh, nice to Nick. Yeah, go Prince. But if ref not nice to Nick, oh, fuck you and fuck Prince. <laughs> no, I mean, Nick Nurse cannot be like not into Prince. Prince is absolutely his favorite musical artist of all time. He really is like the way he talks about Prince, his face just lights up. So like, seriously, there are a few refs that really love Prince and that this is not, you know, this is not a bad thing. This is something that I was speculating about last year with the ref report. It's like, I hope the Raptors look at this stuff and utilize this information for their bet, their, their, their own good in the game. And he does. He, he said that he does. He said that this is one of the things that he likes about the ref report. He doesn't like seeing who the refs are and freaking out about, Ooh, Oh my gosh, Ed Malloy, Ooh, Ed Malloy. You know, he rather take the information about their likes and use it in a way that he can use it to the Raptors advantage in the game. Is that so cool? That is so cool. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, Monique saying, I don't want to give all the secrets of it. See, that's what I'm saying. Monique is like, I'm kind of with Monique. There's stuff that I know about the Raptors coaching staff now that I didn't know yesterday when I got on the stream. And I should be telling you guys some of it. I don't remember off the top of my head, but some of it is like, I'm hesitant to put it more out there on blast because in some ways this is stuff that maybe we don't want other people to know. Like, all right, here's one. Listen, you cannot say the word close out at, in Raptors practices or anywhere. If you go to the game as a fan, he said this. If you go to the game at the fan, as a fan and he hears you near courtside say the word close out, he's going to be mad at you. In fact, they've been trained to, look, to get mad. They don't like this term. They think it's a bad term because in some ways I can understand. Like when you say a close out, that means rushing towards an offensive player to stop them from making an open shot. Because they're kind of open and you got to run at them real quick. He doesn't like that term. And it could be because when you do a closeout, the implications of a closeout is you're going to run into them or make contact with them. So they have different phrases for that. And that closeout is a banned word or term in the Raptors coaching staff and team that they're not allowed to use the word closeout. That if you hear somebody say the word closeout, he gets mad and he says, we don't use that term on this team, guys. So there's interesting stuff like that. And his whole thing, all right, Greg's long arm monster, my fidget spinners and stuff, it's the eagle, guys. That's the official name for what Nick is doing with these guys. When they have their arms out, they're all got their arms out like this. He said, do the eagle. He says, get eagle. He yells the word eagle, 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 eagle in a game. He means he wants them to spread their arms out and get really like in a good defensive pose. And stuff like that. And that they keep track of how many eagles the players do during the game, their percentage of eagles on defensive plays. And they tell them this is part of that stat thing I was talking about earlier that they put up on the on in the wall in the game in the in the war room when they're getting ready for games or having meetings. They put that stat up there at what percentage of eagles they did on each possession. And that that's something that they compete about, too, is how many times down the court did they get spread out and get in that really good defensive pose to cause deflections and all kinds of problems and stuff like that. That man is brilliant, honestly, like he really knows basketball and he is absolutely insane about winning and stuff like that. So it's like I just have more and more uh, uh, um, uh, faith. And Nick Nurse, and that we we're, we're gonna win because this man is for real, and he really knows what he's doing. Yeah, uh, Tom Duke is saying crazy that the trade proposal for a prisoner swap with Russia is they get back an arms dealer. Yeah, he's like the book called the butcher or something, and he's like he's somebody who's been partly responsible for a lot of deaths and stuff like that. It's not a good trade in some ways, like in a lot of ways, but it is something. In I don't know, I don't even want to get into it. I don't pay attention to it too in depth. Just surface level. Like, I don't even want to know about these guys that she might get traded for to get her freedom and stuff like that. 
So Sue's saying, yeah, Tom, the world is a crazy place right now. I feel so bad for her. I know. I mean, listen, Russia, you ain't never going to have no Americans come to any of your basketball or any of your sports ever again to come over there. We've seen a horror story now with Brittany Griner. This is going to be a movie. This may be a lifetime movie. It could be a full length in the movie theater movie. It's going to be at least a lifetime movie. I know that, but it could be in the movie theater movie uh, after this all is said and done. You think anybody in the WNBA will ever go back to Russia again? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You think any NBA players will want to come back there ever again? No. This Listen, this invasion of Ukraine has been bad in all kinds of different ways for Russia, whether it's economically, whether it's just in politically and good standing around the world. It's shown how weak they are. They've lost McDonald's. They've lost all kinds of huge Western corporations being involved in the country. It's going to be really bad for Russia in the years to come because of this. They're going to get a real shadow put on them as far as the rest of the world turning their backs on them. And in this is in this way, it's going to be in athletics that they're just not going to get any foreign players uh, from North America, at least. I don't think Canadians will want to go there either after seeing what happened to Brittany and stuff like that. So uh, Monique saying Raptors were streaming at the Great Museum last night. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. OK, so they were doing a little bit about the thing. Uh, it's Spadina House. I did get more information. The two dates this weekend, uh, tonight and tomorrow, are the opening nights. But this exhibit will be open to the public for free for weeks from now. So anybody who was wanting to go see the Afrofuturist ex art exhibit at Spadina House Museum, uh, you can go see it anytime starting tonight. And that it will be open for a while. And I saw the Malachi portrait. There's other portraits. There's a Gary portrait. Um, it's really, really cool. Like that mashing up of the Raptors with like old styles, old eras in history and like putting it in that classic building. The architecture of Spadina House is very much from a certain era. So it's going to be it's going to be a really cool exhibit. I think I'm going to have to get out of the house and get down there and check it out myself. And I don't do a whole lot of that these days. I try and stay here. <laughs> Uh, Sue's saying, did you see the interview with Kyle on Vince Carter's show? Kyle said that he wanted Vince on the wraps for a championship season, and apparently Vince was into it. Not sure if Vince was blowing smoke, but Kyle was all over it. Well, there was a lot of talk about this by the fan nation around this time, if you remember, Sue. We were wanting Vince to come back and retire as a Raptor. We thought that it would be a beautiful thing to have Vince Carter on our team and, you know, have a storybook ending where like we win a championship with him on the team after all this time gone and maybe heal some of this bad stuff about when he left and stuff like that. That's interesting. I haven't watched that interview. I probably should watch it just because it's two very important Raptors. But I watched the first episode of Vince Carter's uh uh podcast and I, I didn't i he pissed me off he made me mad at him so i was kind of like yeah i don't know if i'm gonna get into vince's show but then when i saw you had kyle on there although i did see the clip where they're making fun of jimmy butler's hair but i didn't know that they did this that they talked about vince possibly playing for the raptors late in his career around when we won the championship and that vince would have been down with it well I, I could see that it was we were really trying to figure it out and feel it out and make it possibly happen a lot of fans were into the idea i was not against it i thought that it could be good for him mending problems with us and him and that it might have been a lot of fun to have vince carter as a throwback uh, you know, he really would have been the end of the bench, like uh, Goran Dragic last year kind of thing, uh, not playing a whole lot. But he would have been a great character to have around and be really interesting in full circle. I think it would have really helped mend a lot of things. And I wish he had done that, honestly. I wish he had come back and played for the Raptors right at the end of his career and retired as a Raptor. But it, it, it didn't happen. He didn't want it that bad, obviously. And, or maybe the Raptors just weren't interested at all in getting him also. That's the other thing. Yeah. Kyle, I bet Kyle would have been into that. I would have been into that. I'm, I'm not against that. I think that that would have been a really good positive thing if it had happened. Good morning to Lolita. Uh, I watched the video of the Raptors in Rico Hines training camp looking good. I can't wait for the season to start. Go Raptors. A lot of them are looking good. Of course, these highlights and things like you can take only so much from them. But the whole thing that we will say is that, listen, we're at this point in the Raptors history where all every single one of the Raptors has voluntarily showed up and they're working together and they're committed like this. This is amazing. 
This is so good. This really shows that these guys are committed to getting W's, getting another Larry O'Brien and being on a mission. That, you know, this could be a time in the year like when Kyle Lowry would just be golfing like he is in Toronto this week and stuff like that. He's not with the Miami players. He's not running around with them. I don't know what Golden State guys are doing right now. I'll bet you Clay Thompson's probably working on a hangover today. But other than that, you know, who else is getting a leg up like we are right now? And this could smack a little bit of like, think about the bubble year when the Lakers and the Clippers and the Miami Heat were all practicing when everybody else was at home, staying, uh, you know, away from each other because the pandemic. Well, maybe we're going to get a leg up like those teams did at, during the whole stupid bubble because we're working out and we're getting extra time in all together. And they really are putting them all together on the same teams. It's like we have Raptors team A and Raptors team B. And actually, I should talk about this, the way they broke this down. Like if we had Raptors team one was Pascal, Scotty, uh, Delano, um, uh, Christian Coloco, and DJ Wilson. That was Raptors team one. That's a huge team. <laughs> like who's the point guard there? Scotty. Uh, so and then you've got all the guys are six, seven and above. Like, think about that. It's like Scotty and Delano at guards, Pascal and DJ at Ford and then Coloco at center. That's a huge team. And then our Raptors B team in that clip was uh, Jeff Doughton, Ron Harper, Jr., um, Malachi. Uh, and then some guy that played on the 905, a white guy who's not officially on a roster. And then this other dude who um, who's famous, who's played on uh, Jared Culver is his name, I believe. And he was like, uh, he's a prospect and people were like, Oh, is he on the Raptors? But he's not actually on the Raptors either. He's just a fill in on that. But then we've seen in the clips in the last day or so, like I said, OG, Gary Trent Jr., Chris Boucher, Thad Young, uh, Fred Van Vliet, they're all there also and put in work. Like, it's, oh my gosh, it's so fun and so cool to see. And I was trying to figure out who won what. Like, it's usually downs. The winning team stays on the court they're on and they have to move and stuff. But there was no rhyme or reason to how they were doing it, I could tell. That it was just kind of round robin, switching up. Okay, you play this team, you play this team, and stuff like that. If they were doing it that way, then James's team, James Harden's team, was doing very well. It was James Harden, Tyrese Halliburton, and uh, uh, Thomas Bryant on the same team, and uh, you know they held the court first and beat our Raptors A team, and then this, the Raptors B team came over and beat them <laughs> afterwards. Ron Harper and Jeff Dalton's team beat them. Uh, so blah, 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 blah. Uh, Monique saying it's the connection between the, the two Pascal and Christian. Yeah. Listen, seriously, go back and watch that half hour footage from Rico Hines this week and tell me the two times you see Pascal have the hugest smile on the court after Christian Coloco does something amazing near the basket on a rebound. Yeah. He's feeling real good about this. And Scotty's looking really intense. Like he's really intense. Like if I take my knowledge of watching him on Twitch this summer, he is saying stuff like, I'm going to cook you. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to get up on that rim. And, uh, he's like, he's all about dominating. He's all about being the big dog on the court. And he looks like a big dog on the court at Rico Hines right now. And he's out there bumping Montrez Harrell off. Like it's nothing. But that's Montrez Harrell. That's Montrez Harrell. Somebody that we were wondering and worried about, he killed us at the beginning of the season last year with a huge monster game with almost 20 rebounds and like almost 20 points, like almost a 2020 game. He's just dominating. And now we got Scotty showing up at Rico Hines, bouncing him off like he's just a bounce. Boof. And he, he goes flying underneath the basket and Scotty's laying it in. There's a couple of plays like that where he's it's like that's not a, just a normal Rico Hines scrub or anything like that. That is I mean, I'm not saying there's anybody who's a scrub at Rico Hines. I'm just saying that's not just like a nobody that's at Rico Hines. That's Montrez Harrell that Scotty Barnes is bouncing off with physicality. And like getting results, like you come near him, boom, he's knocking you off with his shoulder and he's just making room and he's putting the ball in stuff like that. I love it so much. It's so, so badass to see. Uh, let's see. CC saying, Sue, I saw that, but I don't didn't know what exact season Kyle was trying to get Vince back. It's very interesting that Vince was trying to retire as a Raptor. Gee, yeah. Yeah, it would have, could have, should have, didn't happen. It just didn't happen. If it was so important, you would have made it happen, Vince, and it didn't happen. It isn't what it, it wasn't meant to be. It's supposed to be the way it is and stuff like that. 
you know, they can say what it could have showed us. Just like Tracy and Vince saying, oh, I wish we had stuck around for Toronto and tried, really tried to make a championship happen here and stuff like that. Alistair saying Scotty shredded. Well, he, he will be a bully. He's going to be a bully. He wants to be a bully. That's his mentality. When we see him in the in 2K twitches, he's being a bully to other people. He's like, oh, I'm going to beat you down, little man. He's like, I'm the big man, you little baby. He's like, this is the kind of shit he says when he's playing the video game. And he's dominating and dunking on people. He's like, oh, you're the little baby. I'm the big man. Stuff like that. Big four, big four, dunking. <laughs> you know, he's crazy. Like, it is really kind of like he's not into the sun stuff, although he's been doing it a little bit lately. But he's really into, like, showing that I'm the alpha. I'm the big badass. And you guys can't stop me. There's no way you can stop me. And this is really good. This is the kind of DNA these kind of really good superstar players need to have. That they they thirst to be the most dominant person on the court, and Scotty's got that. He's definitely got that, and that's the thing. You balance that with uh, his unselfishness with passing, and then his want to to win and dominate the game. Look out. Because he's not only going to be able to do it through offensive scoring by himself. He's going to be able to make winning plays and crazy passes. Like there's been some really cool passes in the Rico Hines highlights. There's a there's a pass that Pascal does to um, Scotty. We're starting to see that synergy between the two point forwards. Where Pascal's up at the top of the key and Scotty's on the baseline. And Pascal threw it over his shoulder. No look. Pass to Scotty at the baseline. And Scotty got the lay in at the basket. So this is the thing. Pascal has some passing skills that are underrated also and some things that he may be doing that we may all be shocked about and stuff like that, too. So, man, there's so much to look forward to as a Raptor fan. There's so many discoveries and exciting things that are going to happen this season. Trust me. Uh, David S is saying, I was happy to see Flynn at Rico Hines camp. I don't have a ton of hope for him, but there is still a prayer and I'm rooting for him. I have more hope and for him than ever right now they really believe in him like i'm telling you Masai believes in him nick nurse believes in him the the i know i said that and people are like well why doesn't he play him well a lot of it's situational a lot of it's situational and like we said he may have came just at the tail end of an era that is not going to be the same anymore for the raptors going forward that he's a remnant of the old way of thinking but this is what i have to say in his favor for malachi he's a true baller like this guy is a hooper. He's a dude who cares and he can really fill it up. Like if we see, look at some of the Malachi highlights from this week and Rico Hines, he's doing a couple things that are really nice. Like he's beating Scotty off the dribble on defense. There's one play where Scotty's guarding Malachi and he's up close on him with his Eagle. He's right in his face. And Malachi does a little bit of crossover, a little bit of do, 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 do. And he's around Scotty and he's laying the ball in. And there's a few highlights like that with Malachi Flynn. He's also hit a couple of open shots. But if you watch the unfiltered half hour clip that was on YouTube from Rico Hines channel, um, you will see Malachi miss a lot of shots, too. He misses some shots and so like that's the stuff that I don't want to see. I don't want to see him missing shots. He's got to make all of his shots. And Nick has said this this week, that the guys who make the most shots will be on the team, at least in the training cap battle. But you know what? Malachi's made. He's on the team. He's got at least that for sure. He's going to be good this year, guys. I can already tell. Like, there's something about him that's changed. Like, he's like, I don't give a shit anymore. I'm playing for my life. He's going to go all out. And he's that kind of guy. And that's part of the reason why he's putting up these huge gaudy numbers in the Pro-Ams this summer is that he's trying to tell us he's for real and he wants respect and he's coming for it and that he just didn't get the amount of right time to actually showcase who he truly is in the NBA yet, that he wants it and he's going to demand it. He's going to come and take it. For some reason, I have a really weird feeling about Malachi that he's going to be everything we've ever wanted him to be this season, finally. And that he is going to come through and prove that once again, Masai was a genius this whole time for not giving up on him, for not, you know, maligning him or doing this. Thing. We believe in him. He's going to come around. He's going to do what he's going to do. So this is going to be interesting to see the Malachi saga in his third year as an NBA pro and see what happens. Cause this man is a serious. He's very serious. And tomorrow we'll do Saturday share the love club, Malachi Flynn. I think that I, he deserves it at this point because he's been so maligned and he really is trying his damnedest 
to do what he get his chance and he just hasn't had it right. So we'll have to see what happens. Uh, Monique saying the fact that Kyle trimmed down so much. Wow. Yeah. This time of year, Kyle's waistline should not be looking like this. If we're going by the history of the Raptors and him being on this team, he would have a waistline in August right about this time. Something that he'd have to work off in September and October. So yeah, it is. It's cool to see and stuff like that. But once again, Kyle Lowry being in Toronto and being at Nick nurse's, charity golf tournament whereas none of the players on the raptors were there because they're all working there's a difference right there and i'm not saying that kyle's not working hard or not doing things i'm just saying that that is a difference that nobody they he couldn't get one single raptor to play in that charity golf tournament because they were all busy getting work in i love that so much shane saying kyle lost all of his cushion for taking charges he really has trimmed down yeah I don't know. That may be bad. Like that may be part of his magic is having that big booty so that he can land on it. So he's not getting all beat up and stuff like that. It's crazy. The things we learned about Kyle and when he took charges that he'd skin his elbows, his elbows would be so bruised and skinned up from the amount of charges that he takes in the NBA and stuff. He really does sacrifice his body when he does that kind of work. This is the reason why nobody else is doing it in the league as much as he is like he does. Is because it's uh, you pay for it with your with physically with your body and stuff like that. So it's so cool that um, you know I like that Kyle's in better shape now. I like that he's showing a commitment. I like that these kind of things are happening for him and stuff like that. You know, I wish he had done it more earlier in his career, though. That, I'll just say that uh, Monique is saying uh, Nick Nurse has been playing piano for a few years now. Yeah, it's really good that he does this to calm himself down. He says, like, I don't he, and he's really like this. Like he said, if somebody comes to him, they want to talk to him about the game too early. Like if it's a player, if it's anybody in the front office, he's just like, no, he'll come in after the game and he'll say a little thing in the locker room just real quick. He'll say some things like good game, guys, good game, stuff like that. High five, stuff like that. But he won't really get too in depth with anybody. He won't go off on anybody either. He won't go in there and like ream somebody out for a really bad game right away. He really waits until the media room the next day and they're having the team meeting the next day. And then he lets them he lets them sleep on it. He lets them have time to deal with it on their own. Because once again, it is really true that half of what happens to us is our reaction to it. That if you can temper a bad reaction or getting way too emotional or out of control about it, just kind of look at it as like, okay, we lost. This sucks. I played shitty, you know, and then go to bed, sleep on it, get up the next day. You know, you had a little bit of time and then like look at it, like right directly at it at the meeting in the morning and then really get real in that way. It kind of saves you some grief is what I'm saying. Stuff like that. So uh, CC saying Doc Rivers may take up piano now. <laughs> It's going to be like, <laughs> he's going to be playing chopsticks. Ah, that's funny. Oh, man. All right. That's funny. You guys are laughing about that, too. I like that. Uh, Monique saying Raptors today captured the full golf tournament by Nick Nurse and his foundation. So awesome. Oh, really? They have the whole thing? I'd love to see that and see who all was playing and stuff like that. I know Lindsey Dunn and Eric Smith were playing it also as media members. But uh, I don't know who if there were many other celebrities there other than Dr. J and Kyle Lowry. That is really probably more just like Canadian D-list celebrities of some sort. I don't know. Uh, CC saying, in reference to Gasol, I re recall he had slimmed down a lot before the bubble. I wonder if the issue was for real, his hamstring. Yeah, he said in particular those two guys that, that really hurt us in the Boston series were that those two guys weren't their normal selves, that he couldn't use Mark like he wanted to. And that's something that we didn't really ever notice or talk about at that time, that Mark Gasol was not, you know, maybe we noticed it. I kind of vaguely remember Mark not getting a huge amount of minutes in that series and stuff like that. But there was a reason. And there was a reason. I do remember him being slimmer, too. I don't know what it was going on there. Uh, Lolita saying, question, when she is released from Russia, will she be allowed to travel as a player? Nine years is way too much. What judgment is that? That is their laws in Russia, that they are very anti-marijuana. They're very like in this, is you know, this is the kind of thing like in the southern United States, there'll be a small county in like Kentucky or Georgia, and they'll have a speed trap on a hill that's going downhill. And they try and ticket people from out of town. People are just passing through tourists to get that money grab. 
Like they may be on their way to Disney World and just passing through Georgia, but that sheriff is there to get some money. Well, this is a similar kind of thing. If you're going to travel to Russia, don't bring anything marijuana, any kind of marijuana product, because they will use you to make money off you or have you as a political prisoner. This is kind of dumb by Brittany. She shouldn't have done this. Like she should have understood that it's a lot more strict there. And but also at the same time, this is way too harsh. This is way too crazy. And it's not what she's used to. So, yeah, it's really, really dumb. And it's just partly like uh, a mechanism to get people in trouble and then maybe fall into a pit hole uh, like this and have a political prisoner all of a sudden that, that they can use from the other end. They, they, could have, they could have made up any kind of charge and charged her, you know, if they really wanted to at that moment. They were about to break out in war. And that Putin may be like, well, what American assets or American famous people are in my country right now? And that they could have looked for anything just to get something like this to have a little chip, a bargaining chip on their side and stuff like that. That's the way it looks like to me. So I wouldn't I mean, it's not like what she did would be illegal in Colorado. It's not like what she did would be illegal here in Toronto. There's nothing about what she had that is illegal in these places at this point. So. It's really it, it's really messed up. But th there was a tourist who came to Russia and had a similar thing and got charged nine years. So this is the typical sentence that Russia gives for this little bit of this kind of like marijuana oil. <laughs> it's not even marijuana. It's like marijuana oil. And they said like it's the amount of like maybe a, your fingertip or something like that. There's barely any of it. It's really overreaching and just overly super strict. Uh, drug laws over there and stuff like that. So David's saying it's Russian judgment. <sighs> yeah, it was, Russian judgment is very poor is what I'll say because they invaded a, Ukraine and they really, really backfired. Honestly, uh, Monique saying the entire grinder story is sickening. Even Fred's fiance opened up in her IG stories. 58 days to go. Let's go Raptors. I love that Monique's keeping track of how many days we have until the season starts. I love that. Maybe is that the season or preseason? I'd be counting down the training camp opening and, and you know, Victoria, that's when I'd be counting down to. Um, but yeah, the whole Brittany Griner thing has been going on too long. It's just how it, ha it has to work out and stuff like that. I feel bad for her. Like, honestly, this is a tough lesson. And this would shape her. We just need to get her out of there. Like she said this week, she's worried that she's going to die in a Russian prison right now. And, you know, the, the, the things over there, if you've ever watched a series like Locked Up Abroad, uh, you know that uh, law, justice and legal systems and like, uh, you know, things like that in other countries aren't exactly the same as here and stuff like that. There may be some scary shit and stuff like that. So uh, David's saying, interesting, DJ Wilson is there and no Justin or Svi. I imagine both of them will not be here next year. Well, that's very telling. And I was thinking about this, too. It's like not only that, DJ Wilson was not playing on the B team with Je Jeff Doughton and Ron Harper Jr., he was playing on the A-team with Pascal, Scotty, and Coloco and uh, Delano. So that's – and Delano himself being on that A-team instead of Malachi. Think about that. They could have put Malachi with the main guys. They put Delano with the main guys and DJ Wilson. That really is kind of a tipping the cap, uh, a little bit of information. And DJ Wilson looked good in the highlights. Like he was doing different things defensively. Uh, he had some offensive stuff. I think he hit a three or something like that, things like that. But this is telling. Now, Sfi's busy in Europe with Ukraine stuff, but it could be that he doesn't even come back and show up, that we just buy him out and that he has never really been a part of the plans. And he knows this already. So why would he come and show up and stuff like that? Justin, Justin may be still hurt and he can't play in this. That's what I'm saying. And Nick said this too. Holy crap. I just remembered. He said this in the golf tournament interview that sometimes injury decides camp battles. So take that as you want. And he's also said, I really like Justin. You know, I really like Justin. So this is the two things he said. Camp battles can be determined by injury sometimes. So Justin, this is the worst time for you to get hurt. And this summer league, Miss Rico Hines runs. Yeah, this is not the time to be hurt. <laughs> and I don't know how hurt you are. Like, I didn't even think you were that hurt. And when I heard you weren't playing in summer league, I was like, this is really bad for his career. And it's getting worse because he's not involved in Rico Hines now. And yeah, DJ Wilson being at both is a big leg up. 
and stuff like that. So, yeah, hmm, I'm just saying that's what I'm saying. Uh, Lily is saying, I like the way that Vince and Kyle were explaining about their experience as a black man in Toronto, how positive they are, how they love Toronto. They both do really love Toronto, but on the down low also, they both are haters of the weather and the customs and the taxes and, you know, different things like that. Kyle was doing that this week at the golf tournament, dissing our weather. <laughs> ah, I got to give him a pass. He gets a pass. He earned it. He did everything right. But Vince, you can't diss our weather and stuff like that. But, you know, they love the city. They love the culture. They love the multiculturalism. They love the, the metropolitanness of Toronto. But they don't like the weather. They, that's just purely the truth. The kid from uh, West Palm Beach, uh, like Vince Carter, he's from there, the same place that Scotty's from down there. You know, it was different for him, just like it was for Scotty. But I think Scotty's kind of like adjusting to the weather a little bit better. and stuff. Like, Because he's complained about hot weather, too. Like he said, it was way too hot in Las Vegas during summer league. So, you know, there's a balance here. Uh, Raymond Jacobs saying Russians crazy strict on weed, but OK to have vodka for breakfast, lunch and dinner. And some even start bottle feeding babies of vodka. Yeah. And it's not all regulated either. These people make their own potato vodka and stuff like that. And some of it is very dangerous, very, very dangerous vodka and stuff like that. So, yeah, like, look, whatever. They're going to pick and choose. People are going to pick and choose like fucked up things to come down on people. It's the history of marijuana and black people in the United States. You know, I could get away with marijuana and things in my youth way more than my friend Anton could just because he was black and I was white. So it's like I, something like me walking down the street, having a little joint. Oh, maybe they'll just take my joint, put it out. But they're not arresting me. They'll give me shit. Whereas if Anton was walking down the street with that joint, they probably would put him in the back of a car. So that's what I'm saying. Sometimes these kind of drug laws and stuff like that are very racially coded and that they want people in jail of a certain type. And that this is an easy way to do it. And that's why they give white kids a break is what I'm saying. Stuff like that. Uh, Monique saying, I wonder how the traveling will look like Adrian Griffin this season. Um, it's really cool that we are playing so many games in preseason in different places. We don't get a couple of games here in Toronto. I hate that in some ways, but I also really love that Edmonton and Montreal are going to get games. And like Nick said, right off the bat, we're going to be doing so much traveling. It's weird because it's not even like it's in the right. I would like it if they could go West to East with the, the preseason, but we're going to be in like Edmonton and play Utah. And then we're going to go to Boston and play Boston in Boston. And then we're going to go to Houston and play Houston in Houston. And then we're going to come to Chicago. Uh, no, come to Toronto and play Chicago. And then we go to Montreal and play Boston. So we're going to do a little cross kind of like pattern with our preseason schedule. Um, and in some ways, I don't like the, the first Boston game in Boston being before the Houston game. I'd almost rather play that at uh, Edmonton, Houston, then go to Boston, then go to Toronto, then go to Montreal kind of thing. But it is what it is. Um, and Monique, uh, are you talking about like one of the things that Nick said, and we knew this, this was actually something that he's divulged in the past, that all of his assistant coaches don't have just one job, that they they rotate. They, they do. One of them will be the offensive coach for a few games like maybe 15 games of the season, you're the defensive coach and then you switch and you're now the offensive coach for the next section of the games. And then, then you're the end game uh, special teams coach. And then you're like, you go to scouting coach. You, they rotate all of his coaches. And that he said the reason why he did this, this is really interesting, is that when he got hired to the Raptors and he was coaching under Dwayne Casey, he was always specifically their offensive coach. That Nick Nurse was our offensive coach the whole time when Dwayne Casey was the coach. And they didn't like that. He didn't like being tied into just one spot on the team. In fact, he said himself, I'm a better defensive coach than an offensive coach. And that in some ways I didn't get totally, truly utilized on the Raptors coaching staff before when I was just only being the offensive coach. And that when he became the head coach, uh, when we fired Casey in that year, he started this so that our, his assistant coaches would have chances to do all the roles and get good at all of them because he felt like he was stymied by the only being the offensive coach for years for the Raptors. So that's why he does that. And he switches it up uh, regularly. Like he said, does, he does it every like 15 games, every season, he'll switch everybody's role. 
so that they're doing something different. And then there's also this is something that was been brought up in the last day or so. Also, there's a distinction between the two types of uh, roles on his his coaching staff that either you're a bench coach or you're a development coach. And then I think Rico Hines, as people have said this week, he's going to be sitting in the back row as a development coach and he won't necessarily be on the bench uh, as a bench coach. And the, the, half the staff is development staff, like guys that do metrics, guys that do different things. Like some of them are sports psychologists. We have a sports psychologist coach that is on the team just to talk to the players and make sure that they're mentally feeling good, that they, maybe it's just somebody to talk to. And Nick was saying that they, he doesn't even have proprietary knowledge about what that coach talks to the players about because there's a real doctor-client privilege between the players and that particular sports psychology coach on our staff, that they may go and talk to him, that sports psychology coach, and tell him stuff that Nick Nurse won't know and he will never know. So that's very interesting to myself. But like that's what I'm saying. They have the secondary coaches that are development staff coaches, whether they're weight training coaches or like a uh, uh, development coach like Rico Hines. And then you have your bench coaches like Adrian Griffin, Earl Watson, uh, Nate Bjorngren, those guys that sit on the front with him. And they're more involved with him in, in game and stuff like that. And he said that all these coaches, it's really important on his team that uh, the coaches give good energy. Like he looks at energy as something that you either give or you take and that you can be, you know what we're talking about? Like in life, there are energy vampires or people that you can be around that just suck you dry of feeling anything. Oh, they're like, ah, this Janice has come into my office again and just dumped all her shit on me again. Oh, fuck you, Janice. You just ruined my day. You know, that kind of shit. Or maybe, you know, some people that come in, they're so loving and they're like so giving and you feel even better after you, you've seen them. So pay attention to energy is what Nick Nurse is saying. And then if he, he wants his coaching staff to be very giving with their energy, like this is something that they all think about. Like they need to be giving energy to the players, not dragging them down, not making them feel worse or anything like that. It's about giving them energy and propelling them towards success by pushing good energy into them from themselves and stuff. And he really pays attention to this, that it's very important. If it's, he has a coach on his team that is not giving good energy to the team, he will fire them is what he said and stuff like that. So all kinds of cool stuff. Like Nick was telling us about what happens when they stand away from the team uh, in timeouts, like you'll see the coaches get together away from the team underneath the basket and they'll talk for a second. What they're saying is who they're going to put in and who they're going to take out. They're basically saying like away from the players is like, all right, he's not doing it. We got to take him out. We need to get this guy in. And they're figuring out their substitutions over there. And then the other thing that Nick does is he's not the kind of coach that just says everything has to be what he decides that he gets ideas from every single one of his assistant coaches around him and they pull them and they figure out the best thing. Like whether Nate has something, whether uh, Adrian has something, Earl Watson, whatever. They'll tell them in that little powwow, that little uh, get together out in the middle of the court, and then they'll go over and then they'll join the team and talk to them. And he's even said at times he would leave it up to people like Kyle and Fred that if they had an idea about what they wanted to do in an instance, that they were allowed to say, let's do this, guys, and they go ahead and do it and stuff like that. He's really, really laissez-faire about things. Like he, At one point during his lecture, he played video montages of Raptors highlights to, uh, uh, who was it? It was uh, Coltrane. John Coltrane, like he's playing jazz. He's playing freeform jazz with the, the, the highlights of the Raptors. And he's saying like, look, the way that you become predictable in basketball is if you do the same thing all the time and they understand your system and what you are predicted to do. That's why I am all about the players being uh, freestyling sometimes. That he says that at points and times of the game, sure, I'll call a play or we'll have set stuff. But he really encourages the players to kind of go off the, the script at times. That's why we may see Fred or Pascal do stuff that's like, wait, what are they doing? This isn't like that's them improvising. And he really does feel like that's an important part 
of basketball. And this may be part of why we're we, we, watching Scotty on his Twitch, watching his highlights saying, oh, yeah, I wasn't knowing what I was doing with that left handed hook. I didn't even know I could do that. I'd never done that in a game. That may be partly because of the coaching of Nick saying, go ahead and experiment, try stuff. I'm not going to come down on you guys as long as it, you know, it's it's smart decision making. And stuff like that. And, you know, you, you, you do, you're doing something, try something, stuff like that. So that was really cool to me, like learning about his uh, philosophy about being free form in uh, basketball playing that like that's some of the ways that you can stay cutting edge and ahead of the game is by being unpredictable and allowing for uh, improvisation on the court. And that's what's happening with the players at times is that we're, they're allowed to improvise. Like Pascal will be allowed to improvise at times in the game. And we may be able to notice those points in times and stuff like that. Cause Nick did admit he doesn't call a lot of plays. He's not about calling plays. He has a system. He likes playing within the system. The guys know the rules of the system. Well, then they can free form inside the rules of that system. And then he doesn't even have to call plays half the time. Like he will call plays from time to time. But for the most part, he's not. He's saying, guys, you know my system. You know what I'm looking for. You know what I want. Go out there and play and w- let things happen and let things go th- the way they're supposed to and stuff like that. So it's really, really illuminating. I, like I said, I learned so much about Nick Nurse and his coaching philosophies and what he's doing out there yesterday from watching six hours of him lecture about it and stuff like that. So crazy. So good. Uh, David saying they didn't do this with preseason last year, did they? Uh, what, pertaining to what, like the travel or having them in different cities? They always have us play at least one preseason game in another Canadian city. Yes, we did play a, a, a preseason game last year. I want to say it was closer to Toronto, though. It was like maybe did we play in Hamilton last week year for a preseason game or something like that? I think we did, but we always play at least one preseason game in other Canadian cities. We've played preseason games in Halifax. We played preseason games in Vancouver. We played preseason games in Winnipeg. We played preseason in the history of the Raptors. Yeah. We played in all these places uh, and that we're just coming back around and hitting it, Edmonton and Montreal this time and stuff like that. All right. We're just over an hour. So basically, the things I wanted to talk about today are the Rico Hines runs have more and more highlights coming out. In fact, I expect another half hour highlight coming out today at some point. So be on the lookout for that. If you really want to be on the cutting edge of finding that ahead, go go ahead and follow Rico Hines YouTube channel because then you'll get it for sure and you'll see it. Now, another way if you want to see the highlights and some of the stuff that isn't on his channel yet is to go on Twitter and just put in his name as a search and you will find a bunch of little snippets that people have, you know, whether it's people that are attending that are inside that they just film little parts that they saw or it's actual stuff from his channel on there also and stuff like that. So CC saying they played a preseason game. That's right. It was in London, Ontario last year. That's right. They played a, their, their open practice for training camp in Hamilton. That's right. They had their training camp in Hamilton. I want to say last year, and they had an open their open practice game. Like they will in Victoria this year uh, where people could come in and watch them there. And then they played the uh, preseason game in London. I think that's right. I think CC's right. So Rico Hines, so much excitement. Last day of Rico Hines runs today. It, it, there was more information about how they run those games and different things like that. And what's important to Rico Hines that I could go into and stuff like that. But it really is just putting in a good effort, getting a good workout and just playing hard and competing and just doing the the, the, the winning plays. And like Rico stresses, do the stuff that makes you the best player to help your team win. To be double down. If there's some sort of skill or role that you have on your team, just do it even ton times better and stuff like that. Uh, let's see. Will you be posting a link in reference to Nick Nurse? What I can do is I can post uh, the channel that has all the 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 videos because it's actually there's like six videos and they're all like an hour each. So it's a lot. There's a lot there. And he says a lot. And it's it's amazing. It's honestly I had one of the most fun afternoons yesterday listening to Nick Nurse and finding out all this stuff. I don't even know. I should have taken notes of every single thing that he said because it was so amazing. Like he's telling stories about the championship 
run and what they did and why they did this. And, you know, he's talking about why they did the box and one to Steph Curry. And he even brings up the whole fact that like they laughed at me when I did the box and one in 2019 in the finals. But now what did the Golden State Warriors do to the Dallas Mavericks this year in the playoffs? They used the box and one on them. So he's like, he's illuminating how, you know, his innovation and the things that he does are getting copycatted by people that were calling foul on it before, <laughs> stuff like that. And he was also talking about when he told the guys that he wanted to do the boxing one against Steph Curry, that Kyle Lowry, he went to him first and he said, Kyle, we're going to do a boxing one on Steph Curry. And Kyle looked at him, he lit up and he's like, you, you mean like in high school? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, so giddy. So Kyle came into the 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 uh, timeout with the players and told them it wasn't Nick that told them Nick told Kyle and Kyle went and told them and Fred lit up he's like Freddie you're gonna be guarding in the box and one and they were so excited to do this is it like it's not something that they practiced a whole lot or they know what it is just because it's basic basketball stuff from like high school and stuff like that but it was really funny to hear Nick talk about how excited they were to implement the box in one at that moment and use it. And it did really well and stuff like that. So that's kind of those, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. It's really cool. Uh, Tom Duke saying, yes, I'm counting down the training camp in indeed feeling spoiled. Cause on the 25th is the world cup qualifier in Victoria. Good day to be a, a Toronto a tomato. Enjoy your day. Yeah, Tom, that's awesome. You're going to get Team Canada basketball and Raptors training camp this year. That's fantastic for Victoria and British Columbia and stuff like that. So happy. Uh, Monique saying, Rico Hines motto, know your big picture. I love that. Tomato, sunflower, sun, cool glasses, sunshine, happy Friday. Let's go, Raptors. That's right. Well, even though I can't remember every single thing I learned about Nick Nurse yesterday, uh, I'm sure I'll remember it from time to time as we go forward into the weeks and months forward from now uh, going into the new season, stuff like that. It is very inspiring and awesome to know more about our head coach, to know that the reason why he's so competitive is because he was the youngest of nine children. And then in his family, they had to fight for every little scrap of food, every little thing. Like if they got some new stuff. There was going to be like, who's going to get it and that kind of stuff in that household and stuff like that. So that really informs us why Nick Nurse is who he is and why he's so competitive and stuff like that. So really, really awesome. Uh, so, yeah, that's the little bit of a digest of some of the stuff he was saying there. If you're really, really more curious, go in depth yourself and check it out. I'll post a link to both. YouTube pages, uh, the page for the Hungary uh, uh, basketball school that has uh, the lectures on it, and then also Rico Hines' YouTube channel on there also, guys. Thanks again for being here for Friday Freak Out. Freaking out about learning so much about Nick Nurse and why he's an amazing person and a badass. I just love it so much. You're welcome, guys. Thank you, David, for being here. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, Raymond saying, is Nick the only one who got into basketball? What does his siblings do? Okay, this is cool. Actually, I got a story about this. Uh, Raymond, he has a brother who referees. That's really interesting. He doesn't referee on any major level. He referees in like high school, college level. But Nick, <laughs> he tells his referee brother, he's like, you better just call it the way it's you see it. And don't call it because of the crowd. Don't call it because of a star player. Don't call it because you're worried about this or this. Call it the way you see it and call it down the line. It's what Nick tells him. So he's telling his brother, who's a ref, everything he wants to say to the referees in the NBA, I'm sure. But I think that's funny that he has one brother that is a referee and that he has these kind of conversations with him about fairness and calling it down the line and not giving favoritism because he's a star player, not giving favoritism because you're afraid of the home crowd and that kind of stuff. I think that's cool. I don't know what any of the, uh, his other siblings do, but he did mention that one of his brothers is a referee. <laughs> and then he's told him this kind of shit and stuff like that. And Nick was funny because like he did divulge also that he does get technicals on purpose. He said almost all of my technicals that I get is very calculated and on purpose to try and fire up my team and stuff like that. We knew this already. We said this a couple times this past season. Nick got the technical and got thrown out on purpose. Well, he admitted it at the coaching thing. Uh, in Hungary that he did do that and stuff like that. There you go, Raymond Jacob. There's your thumbs up. Uh, Monique saying David uh, Nurse is somewhat of a basketball mindset. Yeah, yeah. 
listen, it's amazing. Nick Nurse is the best person for us to have as a coach. Like the, you could tell that Masai always really liked Nick Nurse a lot. You could tell that Kyle Lowry really liked Nick Nurse on the down low as an assistant coach the whole time coming up and stuff like that. And that it, it, the, it may not have made sense when they announced Nick Nurse was the new head coach at that time, but it was really something that was being developed and was supposed to happen for real. And that it is a really, it is the best guy for us to have. And then he even said it is like, we were having problems getting a certain point in the playoffs with Casey and that they brought me in to do this. Oh, this is another good story. And I'll end it on this. Nick's talking about after the Orlando game and the championship run game one, when we lost Orlando as the seventh seed and we were the second seed and you know, we, all the demons that Kyle and DeMar had from the years before in the playoffs, from having such great seasons and then failing in the playoffs, were starting to come around. And that Nick Nurse was a rookie head coach and that this was his first playoff game that he'd ever coached and they lost. Well, he did the same thing that he always does. Like he said, he didn't talk about the game after the game. He just did the, the interview with the press and went home. And then when he came in the next morning in his office, Kyle was there already. And they sat down because if you remember, Kyle didn't score any points in that game and he was getting it. He was getting it hard from the fans and the media and all kinds of stuff. We dumped on him bad and it was toxic to a degree. But this is what Nick said to him when they sat down in their office. He said, listen, Kyle, you and I make a lot of money to do what we do. And that this is why we make a lot of money to do what we do. The abuse we're going to take from the media and the fans about losing game one against to Orlando in the next day or so that we need to just shut up and take this. And we deserve it. You didn't score any points. And I lost, I lost this game for us. We didn't, I didn't coach you guys to win. So he said, that's the way they looked at it. And they got in the same page and how they kind of circled the wagons and didn't get mired in spiraling out of control with how much they were getting criticism for how bad game one against Orlando went in that first round of the championship year that he said, like, we have to own this. We get paid to feel this from them. We get paid the big bucks because when we fail, this is what's going to happen. And that we need to understand this is part of that price. And Kyle was all about it. And that's part of the reason why they bounced back and didn't like mess up. He said that this actually got these guys going. And that we blew them out by over 30 points in game two is partly because they brought them all in and they showed them just how shitty they played against Orlando in that first game. And it kicked them in the head and they did way better. They came out with a way better effort because to Nick, they didn't play with the activity or the way that they're supposed to. And this was really smart because we could have completely crumbled and fell apart after game one against Orlando in that playoff year. And instead, boom, we switched it around. And this is what Nick said after that game two, when we blew them out, he said, now you guys have figured it out. And now you guys can do whatever you want. You want to go win a championship? We can go win a championship now because you guys have figured it out is what he said after we won game two against Orlando. So really good, interesting insight about the playoff run towards the championship in 2019. He's talking about different stages of it. He talks about the finals against the Warriors. He talks about the shot with Kawhi. He talks about, oh my gosh, he talks about Ibaka and different things dealing with him and stuff like that. You know, you could tell that he was at odds with Ibaka at different times when he played for him and stuff like that, that it wasn't all rosy and, and good between Nick Nurse and Serge Ibaka. And that is true and stuff like that. So, yeah. All right. Let's see real quick. Uh, one more real quick, and then I'll log off. Tom Tom Duke saying Nick Nurse gets $8 million a year. League average is around $4 million. Money well spent. Yes, very well spent. Seriously, so well spent. Listen, you got to pay to win. And, you know, that's what the Yankees do. That's what other teams do. Oh, if we invest money in the right areas, like a really good coach, a really good team president, the other stuff will all get figured out. Trust me. The other stuff will all get figured out. All right, guys. So proud to be a part of this nation, Raptors Nation. We have so many good things to look forward to. So much fun. So much fantastic things are going to be coming our way, including more Larry O'Brien's. So let's strap in and get ready for the ride. I know we got some time still. As Monique said, there's 58 days. There's still a lot of time. And I will 
be here every day, still tr trying to make some stuff here. I mean, I hope that even though this is the middle of the off season, if you found my channel today and you're watching my stream today, that you learned something about the Raptors from me and talking just now about things about the Raptors that you had no idea that you didn't know. And that's what you'll get at the Raptors free channel. I am out there trying to find everything like a gold miner in Yosemite is panning through that water to find the gold nuggets to come to you with information about the Raptors so that you don't have to watch four hours of Scotty Barnes twitching and playing video games. So you don't have to watch six hours of Nick Nurse lecturing about coaching basketball in Hungary like Monique and I did yesterday. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. So if you enjoy my channel, the best way you can support me is by hitting that subscribe button. Please like, comment, share. You can do that too. But thank you for being here today. And I'll be back tomorrow. Share the love club. Malachi Flynn. We need to show some love to Malachi, a three-year Raptor. Somebody who's on the cusp of something great. I have a feeling. So please join me. I'll be here at 9.30 a.m. tomorrow. I promise. All right, guys. Have a great Friday. TGIF. And be proud to be in Raptors Nation, the, the most valued franchise in the country of Canada, the most valuable sports franchise in the country of Canada. Doesn't that sound awesome? That sounds great. All right. Let's go Raptors!